coming today and do a Snoop Doggy dog rap. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of strange. This is the black box one, but it's all white. <laughs> 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 I remember when I was at the uh, U.S. Mint, I actually booked a ticket to D.C. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so on the title of it, uh, you know, it's funny. I was driving over from my office. It came from from, from the law firm I work at, and uh, I was listening to David Bowie's Five Years. You know, from that the starter album. It's a whole hook about, you know, five years is all we got left. But I think five years is a good amount of time because five years ago, the Writers of Minds, this event which is, you know, predicated about that group didn't exist. And the past five years, these wonderful writers who I've come to know so, so well uh, have uh, done the organization proud. And uh, also, I'm, I'm very excited about what we're going to do in the next five years because I can only see great things happen for everybody. So, uh, you know, guys. All right, that's that. So, we're still, we're still not paying you. You're not paying me. No. Let's work on that. So, I'm working on a novel, and, um, you know, when you're in the process of writing, you don't know what's going to come out, where it's going to go. Um, perhaps I've read too much Faulkner and too much Tony Morrison, but those writers are kind of obsessed with these narrators who see things very far away, you know, time wise and geographically. So, my narrator at the beginning of the novel I'm working on, is basically looking at New Orleans after it's been destroyed. Because we know that between hurricanes and uh, you know, tidal uh, you know, uh, rising, um, the federal this government, is, they, this is a big problem. And so that's my narrator looking at uh, New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans was a real city once. Of course, now people call that missing swatch of cook marshland. You have to think of it at all. But long before the Gulf of Mexico reached out like the arm of a bad hole and scooped that little piece of Pangea back into the water, New Orleans was a place where people lived actual lives and died real deaths. The natives had it first, then the French settlers, the Spanish, the Americans, and the many people who would start off as something else, only to become eventually, secondarily Americans and more significantly, New Orleans. It was a place repeatedly assaulted by hurricanes, conflagrations, termite holes. <laughs> the land sank beneath the feet of the, of the people, as if that spongy earth were merely a bed of cotton stretched over a cauldron. However, the people persisted, and by the early 21st century, like ants were building their power one more time, you could say that they were coming into their own. But a Midwestern tourist visiting the city for the first time might be aghast at the sight of a woman in ripped holes, clasping hands with some other woman, and skipping across Jackson Square like schoolgirls <coughs> while singing the theme to Laverne and Shirley. That same man, Bob, from, say, Kenosha, Wisconsin, might also turn his nose up at a barebacked young man lazily rolling through the Bywater neighborhood on a unicycle with his friends like a rod of snails, the swollen egg on their back. Tattooed like shells, quoting vertigo. Yet Curtis the Sugar might charm Bob, by the way Curtis could separate 25 oysters from their shells in less than one minute, with the imperceptible flick of a blade. Bob might admire a group of ugly black men in starched flannel shirts gathered from the concrete on South Boulevard Avenue. Those men might could fall for hours and recount all the tales they weren't ready to tell yet. Or perhaps could, back when they worked so hard and long in the city sanitation office, or cutting hair, or piloting street cars. They had the work study and prove that they might see because they were afraid of the city's appetite for blood and wanted to live long enough, just for that very day, to tell those very stories and not end their lives in Templeton prison or by catching the cops bullet to the gut. Yet those days are long gone. And even the historians and anthropologists can't quite figure out why so many people would have willingly lived on such a backwater island, a bowl surrounded on all sides, every man a river, lake, an oceanic body. Some have suggested a reason in the tendency of some of the town citizens to celebrate the death of their loved ones. The so-called jazz funeral, which was attended by light-hearted throngs of well-wishers tossing their white handkerchiefs and umbrellas. Buck jumping and throwing their voices towards the ejection.
Egyptian blue. It was a rare enough occurrence in the human sphere, these ceremonies of celebration and death. After all, if one could dance towards death with a sense of hope, if one could share a tall boy with the grim reaper, then what mortal issue could dampen one's spirit? Now, none of the inhabitants of that strange city thought of it in those terms, though. For hope is either inbred or absent. One has hope, or one doesn't. In the latter part of the first decade of the 21st century, most New Orleanians were more concerned with more immediate matters. How to avoid the potholes that dot the streets like acting scars. <coughs> how to spill your coffee on the way to the office. How to avoid a perpetual hangover of a town where alcohol flowed much more freely and purely than tap water. And how to find true love and keep it. And there, among those now gone people of the city of New Orleans, was one uncertain man called Clark. Yes. A man who had literally forgotten how to live life. 